Okay, so um, so Paul is continuing to um, uh, inform uh, to you know kind of um, give the revelation of um, the seriousness of um, sin of that nature. Right, this is warning them. Okay, even though you know this could be a very permissible culture, now you are part of a different kingdom, and therefore you know this is what um, uh, this is the seriousness of of that kind of a sin. Okay, and in in saying that, he also in verse fifteen he says, "Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ?" So this is he's giving another reason, right? Another uh, understanding. That when you are born again, you automatically are baptized into the body of Christ. You know, which he goes on to explain in chapter 12 also. Right? He says that you are all members of the body of Christ. So spiritually speaking, you are actually part of the, in a, in a spiritual manner, right? part of the body of Christ. And he also says in verse 17, right, uh, that you are one spirit with Christ. We are one spirit with him. And I think it's there in verse 17 also, right? Yeah. He who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Right? So verse 15 is very clear, saying that this is what it is. You are your bodies are members uh, are of Christ. So then when you're talking of sexual immorality, you even that you know, whole temple worship that is happening in Corinth. So he's saying, Can you, being a member of Christ, you know, can you Make your body a member of a harlot. Harlot meaning someone who is a prostitute, someone who sells their body for for the purpose of sex and so on. So um, whether it's ritual worship or whatever, you know, in, in exchange for money or whatever. So he's saying that you know your body is consecrated. Your body is holy. Your body is a member of Christ Jesus. So so he's encouraging the every believer to look at them to look at their body as something that is holy unto God, right? So, um, yes, there are appetites. He's also acknowledging that, but these need to be satisfied in a God-ordained manner, right? Verse 16, do you not know that he, one who is joined to a harlot, is one body with her, for the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Okay. So the 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 whole thing of oneness of spirit, soul, and body, you know, which which marriage, the purpose of what the purpose of marriage is, um, which we read in Genesis, saying, you know, this is this is what the Lord says: the two shall become one, right? Uh, and this is God's original design for marriage: uh, oneness in mind, oneness in spirit, and you know, oneness in in so many other aspects. So uh, this is what the Lord design right so um, and he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him so therefore how can you be part of make yourself part of uh, 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 someone who is a harlot who is who's a prostitute and in uh, you be, you have a how can you have a sexual relationship right so uh, what is designed god designed this in marriage for your spouse so how can we do that Right. So, again, challenging the norm of that day, norm, the culture of that day. Okay, Hebrews 13.4, marriage is honorable among all and uh, the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Okay, So, uh, so he's just going, going on to you know, talk about the seriousness of it and... This is the verse 18, right? Verse 18, this is the advice. This is what he says. Flee sexual immorality. Uh, which is a which is a advice, you know, flee, which means run away from, right? Run away from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Okay. So what is he saying? He's saying, you know, every sin that we commit, right, like most of it, uh, it is outside of the body, it does not affect us. It is external of us, yes, in terms of attitude and thought and motive and some of these sinful acts, right? It could be violent, it could be, um, you know, it, it could violate another person, right? But he's saying this particular thing of sexual sin 
uh, it actually one is sinful one is actually committing it against his own body you know in the light of what peter writes also first peter 2:11 he says that fleshly lust war against the soul you know there is like a attack on our mind and will and emotions and capacity to think imagine capacity to analyze right uh, wanting to do the things that god wants us to do you know our will is damaged right our mind is gets damaged because of sexual sin so he says that fleshly lust the purpose of it is to war against the soul and therefore you know one one who gives in to fleshly lust is going to actually you know is actually kind of committing something against his own body is actually you know destroying damaging his own body right so that is uh, what is this in proverbs you know 522 again you're saying oh, one, one who's committing adultery gets caught in the cords of his sin meaning it's enslaving uh, etc right so verse 19 again it says do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit now you know he is giving various truth or revelation about being a believer that you are part of the body of christ so being a believer you're joined to the lord and therefore you are one spirit with him and then being a believer do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit because now he's talking about you know the, the holy spirit who indwells every believer right so it's a dwelling place of god himself and your body is the temple of the holy spirit then verse 20 goes on to say as a believer you have been purchased you've been bought at a price and therefore the thing is that you are not your own okay so to make these kind of decisions and choices and you know go and fulfill the, your own you know appetites of the body you are not your own you've been bought at a price therefore you glorify god uh, god in your body and in your spirit which are god so he's saying that he, he has bought you you actually belong to god right you are his purchased possession so he owns you now you know you belong to him therefore you make a decision to glorify god in your body in your spirit which ultimately which rightfully belong to him right so uh, that's that's something that he uh, says so this is the uh, this is what he teaches the corinthian believers in order to, for them to stand against sin to make a uh, to make a decision against sexual immorality which is which is very uh, which is there you know everywhere they would turn and see this is what they would see in society this is what they would see in families this is what the conversations would be and uh, so uh, in such a culture you see this church um, at corinth and uh, they are making a difference um, in the lives of people they are being born again but then you know all kinds of people are coming to the church um, yeah they are mature some are immature some are still growing some are struggling and all that so he's giving them this very clear instruction and truth about um you know sexual sin right okay so let's move on to chapter 7 any questions before we move on to chapter 7 anything at all okay 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 let's look at uh, chapter 7 Okay, chapter seven, we you know see that we can categorize that into six uh, sections, right? And here he is uh, talking about marriage, right? So there in chapter six, he's talking about okay, um, you know this is something that's happening about about sexual sin. So he's talking about the other aspect of it, how the appetite of the body is actually fulfilled in the right way. right he's talking about that okay okay so let's uh, read through okay so when we read through we we will see that um, you know uh, he's, he's addressing the fact some of these um, questions people might have some of these doubts people might have about the role of 
the physical aspect of marriage, physical relationship in marriage, you know. So he's told them, hey, this is what it is, um, you know, sexual immorality is sin. So it is possible for someone to consider anything of the flesh to be sin, right? Or anything of the flesh to be avoided. Okay. Any, 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 even if it's a right, rightful, uh, or no, not right, you know, even if it's a, uh, an appetite that is created or des designed by God to be fulfilled in God designed ways, what happens is people can go to the other extreme and consider it to be sinful, consider it to be uh, something that is, uh, you know, something that is to be avoided. So he's putting things in perspective now. He's talking about, you know, this aspect of uh, a sex and physical relationship within marriage. In the right context, right? So let's look at that. So he says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Okay, so again, people have written, right? People have asked. So he's addressing that. Now concerning things of which you wrote to me. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, due her, and likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have the authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Okay, so, so that word touch there, you know, the verse one is saying is implying it's a physical relationship, okay, a sexual of a sexual nature. So he's talking about that. So he's talking about marriage. He's saying, okay, it's it is, um, yeah, you 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 know, need not have a sexual relationship. You should not uh, to have a sexual relationship with a woman. But yes, there is sexual immorality all around. So you know, if you're married. Let a man have his wife, let a woman have her own husband. Okay, so this is not the only reason why a person should get married. You know, we we know that when we study marriage, you know, we see that okay, it's about companionship, it's God's design for godly offspring, and you know, God's plan and purpose, and and so on, right? Now, um, so verse three, he's talking about in a sex in a marriage relationship. He's saying it is normal to have that physical relationship. Okay, so he's saying you know you it is it is normal, and he uses some words to refer to that. He says, "Let the husband render to the wife the affection that is due to her." Okay, so that word "render" means to give away. Okay, to give away something, uh, but you also benefit from your giving render right the affection that is due to her you know the affection meaning uh, kindness and so he's saying you know this work this act of physical act of sex in the marriage is actually kindness your it's an expression of kindness it's an expression of love for your spouse right it's not just satisfying of an appetite but it's an expression of love it's an expression of kindness so he's saying that you know it's uh, you render, which means that th this is something that needs to be given. It's almost uh, you know uh, um, the word that he uses there is it's something that is uh, a word that is used there is to pay off a debt, like something that you owe. So he's saying you know this ex expression of love, kindness, affection is something that a spouse owes. Uh, 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 you know, uh, a man owes his spouse, or a woman owes her spouse, right? In marriage, so he's saying it's 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 something that you'd owe. You, yeah, it's this is how you express, right? And it is fine. So because people can go to another extreme and say, okay, you know, since uh, you know sexually moral, you see a sexually morality, and you know that it is sin, it's unrighteous. Therefore, it is sin in any context, right? It is unholy, etc. No, so he's saying it is an expression of uh, goodwill, kindness, etc., love. Okay, and it's a, something that is due, which means something that you 
you owe the person right and uh, so that's that's something that he says so this is valid perfectly scriptural biblical expression of in marriage right and he also talks about the fact that you know in in the process of expressing expressing sorry uh, affection you know in the physical way you see that you know it is there's no abuse right there's no abuse you um you don't abuse your authority you treat your body with reverence and honor and also you know it's as if uh, he says that you know your you don't have authority over your body and your wife does and and vice versa and so on which means that saying you consider each other with honor with respect like you don't abuse you know you will not abuse your own body normally right so you don't abuse the other person's body as well and he also talks about the fact that okay holiness and you know everything is not just abstinence from this kind of a expression to one another and he says um, he gives a, a you know in verse 5 he says do not deprive one another okay don't hold back withhold this expression of uh, love and kindness uh, affection and to one another don't uh, you know accept with consent right and um, so abstinence is not a is in other words he's saying in verse 6 it's not a command but it's a choice right it's a choice that you make with consent and right? maybe for other you know things like um like prayer or fasting or whatever you know it's it's with consent right so so we see that um paul is uh, you know addressing this a healthy manner right so he's saying you know what is happening in society what you see around is not healthy what is happening is actually destructing is destruction for one's own body not just the body but it's one's own mind it's getting damaged right your decisions decision making everything changes because of this kind of behavior it's a war against the soul so he's warning them then he's also you know presenting what is actually healthy right what is a good way of carrying out whatever god has designed this appetite god it's god given right so how do you express that and how do you you know how do you fulfill that so he is giving the healthy manner healthy way in which it's done right then he goes on to talk about another uh, you know another aspect so so you know one thing to see is that um, you know people had this question right? people had these struggles people have these questions and who is supposed to address it in the right way it is the it is the church right so if, if because if if the church does not teach or if the church says oh this is you know this is sensitive or it's i feel uncomfortable teaching this then the world will teach the society will teach popular opinion will you know will will teach right so so that's the thing right so um, so he's is just sharing it you know uh, as the leader of that particular church and he's you know, that's a, that's again a model for us right to to follow um, that this needs this is something that needs to be taught you know what is healthy what is not right then he talks about singleness okay so he, paul we see that he himself um, was single uh, at that point in life so he says you know for i wish that all men were even as i myself but each one has his own gift from god one in this manner and that another in that so so he said is you know his singleness is addressing it as a gift right but i say to the unmarried and to the widows it is good for them if they remain even as i am right so he's saying that's fine if you if you if you choose to remain single it is fine but if they cannot exercise self control let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion okay so he's talking about singleness and being single as as a gift from god and and so on right and we see that later on he also talks about um, you know uh, uh, about marriage again uh, about singleness again uh, in uh, yeah in verse 10 onwards right he 
and and then in fact the whole chapter is talking about that right okay so um so the thing is that um yeah so we must not use this text like this particular verse you know if they cannot exercise self control let them marry it is better to marry than to burn with passion so you know the misapplication of it would be you know i cannot control myself i can i, I cannot reign over these desires um, therefore you know i i do this in order to fulfill my sexual desires there's a misapplication of it right and also if someone says okay i i am in bondage to this kind of sexual sins okay so that's another thing you know it because you know you see this verse okay um and then you come to the conclusion okay i am in bondage to these kind of sins and it's these are of a sexual manner so the solution is marriage right so that's that's a wrong application of it getting married and getting rid of these bondages are two different things right marriage is a commitment marriage is honoring one another uh, so just that and physical aspect of marriage expression of marriage is one part of it so you know that is not the answer right to bondages you know one needs to be delivered one needs to deal with strongholds one needs to you know by the spirit of god and uh, you know how we see right in uh, romans chapter 8 that if by the spirit we put to death the deeds of the body we will live so so that is the that is a solution right for coming out of bondages and the anointing breaks the yoke and so on so marriage is not the solution right for coming out of such bondages okay so um so he talks about this right then uh, verse 10 onwards now to the married okay he is a command so he is you know uh, he is also we, we note in some of these things uh he makes that difference between um some of his opinions and also what what is a command from the lord okay so an opinion is maybe you know based on your experience and it could be based on your you know your what you perceive to be good and and so on and an opinion also matters right you can say this is my opinion and it will also help it is uh, it is practical wisdom maybe that will help that will be helpful for another person so an opinion right but he also distinguishes between <clears throat> an opinion and a direct command of the lord okay uh so we need to be careful as believers what are you sharing is that a command of the lord it is there in scripture or is it your opinion that that you hold on to right um so we need to make that distinction okay so because in our opinion we could say you know, you know this is the standard of holiness or in our opinion we can say okay this is what people should do etc and the word may not necessarily say that dictate that right uh, like for example a lot of things have come out of that right because of opinion public opinion and like for example uh, even water baptism and uh, holy spirit baptism and things surrounding that people say that okay you need to get rid of this 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 and this and then come and then you can be baptized right uh, you need to spend at least 3 or 4 months uh, as a believer as a regular church member and then you know, we will give you baptism no so these are you know things practices that have come out because of you know sincere uh, you know thought uh, wanting good good uh, you know out of good will for the other person right not wanting the person to fall down but it is a opinion nevertheless right it's not based out of scripture right so so you saying okay so let's read through right verse 10 now to the married i command yet not i but the lord a wife is not to depart from her husband but even if she does depart let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and a husband is not to divorce his wife but to the rest i not the lord so what is he say, referring to is referring to his opinion right to the rest i not the lord say if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him let him not divorce her and a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her let her let her not divorce him for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife 
and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, um, just one second, sorry. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? And how will you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Okay, So he's giving some instructions about marriage. Okay, The first one, he says, is this. You know, uh, He says, this is the command of the Lord. A wife is not to dis uh, depart from her. Husband. So obviously, so they were facing some situations there, uh, some challenges uh, about separation, like in marriage, uh, maybe difficulty in marriage, maybe because of you know one person is a believer and the other person is not, right? So he's saying, okay, uh, you don't depart, right? You don't depart from your husband, and uh, husband is not to divorce his wife, right? So. So obviously, this command he prefaces it by saying is instruction now to the married. I command. Okay, so um, so he's referring to marriages where maybe one person is saved and the other person is not, and because of that, there is tension in the marriage. Okay, so um, they are already married. We need to understand that we need they are already married, and one person comes to know the Lord. The other person has not. So, in such cases, he's saying, you know, you don't run, you don't depart, you don't, you know, just saying that it's difficult, so I cannot live. We have two different beliefs and so on, right? So, so he's saying that, right? And so, uh, so he's saying, you know, if such a person, if somebody departs, okay, even if she does depart. No, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And the same thing applies for the husband as well. Right? So, uh, in other words, we we get to learn about the heart of God. Heart of God is definitely not separation. Heart of God is definitely not divorce. Right. So, if a married couple separates on any other grounds than what is not biblically permitted, so he's saying, don't get married. Don't get. Don't remarry. Sorry, right. So, um, so we we're going to look at you know what what are some biblical grounds. What does the Bible talk about? You know this whole when we are addressing this whole aspect of separation, divorce, remarriage. Does the Bible talk about something? Does it give some? Are there certain grounds for doing so? Right. Certain reasons for doing so. Valid reasons. Um, but overall, we know that divorce and separation is not something that is of God's heart, right? Okay, fine. So, um, if you look at um, you know the a Jewish custom of that particular day, right? Deuteronomy twenty four one, a husband would divorce his wife for just any reason. Right, they could give any reason, and they could divorce, and they would get, uh, you know, in writing or certificate of divorce. Right, so the Pharisees uh, asked the Lord. You know, they came, uh, asked the Lord, and they were actually testing him. And we see this in Matthew 19, right? Matthew 19 verses 3 to 11. So the Pharisees come and ask him, you know, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Okay, and the and the Lord talks tells them and takes them back to Genesis, how uh, he talks about creation and talks about you know this marriage and about being one. He talks about oneness. And therefore, he says, you know, verse 6 in Matthew 19, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Then they have a question, you know, why did then Moses give a command? Why did Moses say that you can actually issue a certificate of divorce and, you know, put that person away and so on? He said, okay, this was because of the hardness of the heart. He permitted you to divorce your wife, but from the beginning it was not so. Then he goes on to say something very important, verse 9, right? He says, whoever divorces his wife, except, okay? So he's talking about, okay, situations where 
divorce could happen right so whoever divorces wife except sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery who marries her who is divorced commits adultery so he's saying that he if there is sexual immorality in a marriage and if that is the reason you know they maybe they are not able to reconcile the person they are not able to forgive they are not uh, and and maybe that thing is continuing you know one person is continually being unfaithful and therefore there's no ground for reconciliation not unwillingness to reconcile forgive etc then he says okay that is a ground for divorce right the original intent is to um you know to live to live together yeah yeah go ahead to ask a question it's uh, related to marriage pastor yeah like about we're talking about this uh, divorce and all what if like uh, the girl she didn't uh, did like sexual immorality but what if he is uh, doing something against his husband again and again for example if she is if she is lying to him and uh, the husband he don't like that habit or behave but again and again she is doing in certain area which is hurting his husband and uh, what uh, it's like extreme extreme what if it's both extreme so what we do about so so the the uh, yeah so the thing is okay what if there is no truth in the marriage there is lying and that is affecting the marriage yes it is possible uh, it happens and of course uh, you know lying which leads to all kinds of complications right um well the first cause of cause of action is definitely counsel and uh, reconciliation so that's the thing that one needs to uh, you know one take should take that course right uh, in the sense the they should take that path the path of reconciliation the path of you know receiving wise counsel now it will not happen automatically we know it will not happen uh, or or you know it will not happen in a day right so there is time given for people to change see as long as the person is willing the other person is saying okay i'm willing to consider this advice that i'm receiving i'm willing to consider this um you know uh, i i i i'm you know i i of course i accept and i confess that what i was doing was wrong so there is you know acknowledgement of wrong doing and also a willingness to change right so um so on both sides both husband and wife you know that should be the Uh, that should be the preferred you know pathway that they should or decision they should take now it is possible that yeah maybe it does not happen over a period of time we are talking about maybe a year maybe years it just happens over and over again now what is what is actually happening in it you know is it unfaithfulness you no know, this is lying thing is it unfaithfulness is it something to do with another person um is it you know that is something that needs to be considered right so the seriousness of it right so it cannot be a general rule we're saying that okay this person is not being truthful therefore you know what is that truthful uh, untruthfulness leading to right obviously it's leading to a breaking of trust right but what is it why is that person doing that you know, that needs to be addressed you know maybe that person is fearful you know if i speak the lie maybe I mean, if i speak the truth maybe that person will get angry there could be other things also you know both from the husband side also so why is the wife you know lying is it because she is afraid of the husband uh, is the husband being physically abusive whatever you know so that needs to be considered and divorce is not something that needs to be taken uh, you know lightly and uh, a decision to be preferred so that's the thing yeah uh so basam <clears throat> my question is regarding divorce only yeah. so in matthew we saw like uh, we can divorce with one reason um yeah so he is giving uh, yeah one yeah. reason saying unfaithfulness okay. um so like i recently i heard like from john chapter 3 that sorry 13 hmm. was uh 34 john 3 13 
John 13 34 okay uh the verse is like this a new commandment i give to you that mm. you love one another and i have loved you that you also love one another yeah. so the person said like this like okay the, so god give the commandment like this like ask how i loved you you should love another right and like if we sin if we this we did sin he forgive us so like also like we have to forgive, forgive yeah or like true so it's not need it should not i was so is it is in right context or it's not like that yeah so see the thing is when we look at god's heart primarily we should understand that god is not for separation or divorce right so even even in malachi he talks about that you know that god hates divorce right so that's the thing so so that is not the preferred decision right however right if it is continued unfaithfulness right so so we say okay yes we are supposed to love we are supposed to forgive as god in christ forgave right that's the thing so so that's the thing that is the that is that is an ingredient for reconciliation right? where we say though, okay i know that you've done i know i'm hurting um but i'm willing to forgive right so um and i'm willing to forgive right so one does that and that will set that is a posture for reconciliation but the question is right what if a person is a in a lifestyle of unfaithfulness right so a person forgives but the other the other person again you know perpetrates the same sin right and over and over and over and over again so so that is that in that situation right where the person is not unwilling you know where um, not willing to accept that um, you know what they are doing is wrong and they are you know it's obviously damaging the marriage it's damaging the family and if there are children you know then it's again you know confusion for the children damaging the children so children also come come to know about it if they are you know growing grown up and growing up and so on so in such a scenario you know god is saying okay you first you work at reconciliation but he is permitting it when there is unfaithfulness so so that's the thing so it's not a, okay you know like um, see one is on one side of it is unfaithfulness come on let's divorce that is one scenario the other side is god has told me to forgive so i'll continue to forgive you know and and to be used like a doormat right where there's a lot of damage being in the created in the marriage and that is also another extreme scenario so yes um so this is the prescription that we have in scripture yes it's a you know it's a case by case thing you know we cannot generally we can't force it on people um and it is um, it's a sensitive thing it's their life so yeah we know of some people who have been strong enough and say you know i i'm, I'm going to hold on i'm going to hold on i'm going to see see this thing through um and i'm going to confront you no know, the, the thing is not you know when we say uh, we i'll forgive it doesn't mean that you don't confront the person you know that's a wrong thing you know saying okay i know he's living like this but uh, you know I, i'm not even going to talk about it i know i'm you know i'm not going to confront that person but i'll i'm going to forgive now that is not that is not uh, love in application because love is we have to speak the truth in love love is because the lord jesus very expression of love uh, it's it's not love is not love when truth is not there one corinthians 13 also talks about it right love well it's uh, it celebrates truth recognizes truth so so that is the other part of it right so if you can forgive great but there is a point when the other person is unwilling to change no matter what and continues to live willfully in sin then at that point you know we're saying okay this is a choice which is there yeah yeah right so um other situations that you know that uh, the bible talks about is uh, um obviously if there is a violation of the covenant you know marriage is a covenant there's a violation of the covenant then there is an abandonment right the person just 
goes. Okay, either husband or wife, it could happen. The person just abandons a family, goes to live with someone else. Here, you know, the spouse and the children are left. There's no support. There's no, you know, there's no communication. This is abandonment. Another situation, it could be even, um, uh, it could be even like, uh, for example, uh, even violence, right? Domestic violence, where there is um, the person is being subject to so much of violence physically. When you know, how would you how would you face that? How would you do that? Well. The thing is, initial, of course, again, try for a reconciliation where there is, you separate the person so that the person is taken to safety, right? One is being, there's so much of violence, you know, you, you have to save their life, you have to preserve their life. So you separate for a season in order to save the person's life and so that there was no damage to their body and mind and all that. So this, you know, and work on the reconciliation, right? But if violence is going to be recurring, you know, it is you know it is sin, you know it is also you know unlawful according to the law of the land, right? So then the, those are also you know biblical we would say biblical grounds for uh, separation, right? Okay. Any other further questions on this? Okay, uh, Chaya says there is one couple believers, one spouse is ready to reconcile, but one is not agreeing for counseling or reconciling. Reconciliation, how can we speak to them or uh, deal? Yeah, this is a difficult thing, right? Um, so one is ready, the other one is not. So I guess uh, for a season, for some, or maybe for a few sessions, uh, we can actually address the one who is willing. And to get an understanding of uh, you know what problems are uh, you know uh, are happening, and also uh, we can address okay what does this person who's willing to come for counselling, what is that person contribution to the problem, right? So maybe that person is also you know, whatever it is to whatever degree whatever what is that person's contribution to the problem, maybe that can be addressed, but it's a it's it's not the solution. Right. The other person should be so one can pray, one can believe that uh, you know, with the change in this person's life, the other person might be at least coming, uh, at, at least come to a point of willingness um, to um, to to be willing to receive counsel at least. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's. Uh, yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah. Yes, Nina. Go ahead, please. Uh, <clears throat> verse fifteen, pastor of seventh chapter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's talking about another condition where it says that if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. Mm. Uh, so a brother or sister is not under bondage. So is this also calling for? I mean, uh. uh speaking about another uh, area. I mean, one is, of course, the only condition which Jesus permitted. Even mm. that he said, I think he permitted because of the hardness of your heart. But yeah. he said, yeah. okay, because of unfaithfulness. But here is yeah. this also another area where they yeah. can... So this is, um, yeah, this is a situation where in a marriage, there is, um, uh, in, in, in the people are already married and one is a believer uh, one has come to the saving knowledge of Christ and the other one is not. And the one who is not uh, a believer uh, and the unbeliever wants to leave. So that is the, that is the thing. That is the scenario here. So here, uh, in such a scenario, he's saying, yes, if they want to depart, let them depart. You know, what is implied is also that, that there will be some kind of, uh, you know, conversation, some discussion, etc. But if if they are unwilling to even listen to all that and then they are willing to depart, then let them depart. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, Matthew. Yeah. yeah. Whoever, I mean, only, only reason for divorce is uh, sexual immorality. Yeah. 
only for them they can marry again. Remarry. Yeah. That's yeah. So the thing is that, you know, um, see other grounds for marriage, like in, in this particular thing we see, um, there is uh, an unbeliever who wants to depart, right? So they are actually deserting, abandoning, right? So that is that is something that is happening. So he's saying, okay, just fine, no problem. Uh, if they want to do it, let them do it. So see, one thing that we can say is, if there is a biblical ground for divorce, like let's say even violence, for example. Now, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if any scripture talks about that, but we know that uh, you know this is the practical thing to do. So um, uh, if there's harm to body and mind and so on. So, so if there is a biblical ground for divorce, then there is the biblical. That is the biblical ground for remarriage so so that's uh, that's the thing so you know uh, so that is preventive in nature in the sense like even people you know for any flimsy reason like okay we're not able to get along uh, we're not compatible etc you know then they can they are, they can reconsider you know the seriousness of the uh, decision right so, so if it's a biblical ground for divorce then yes um, then that is ground for remarriage. Yeah. Um, Family whose wife and husband just newly married, mm. and the her husband divorced the wife because she was not well. She was not well. Well, she got some disease okay. within the six months, mm -hmm. and within the first year before their anniversary, he divorced her actually. So uh, she's in a very deep. Already she's sick, mm. cancer, and um, so now. Uh, there's always the question like whether she can remarry. Mm, mm. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, the divorce happened because of uh, yeah. So the thing is, like, was was the husband angry because it was not revealed to him before the marriage that she was unwell, or he knew? Looking like uh, she has cheated, like. In the sense, uh, he knew she, she was not, but it was wrong. <sighs> She was not aware of any of those. Things. She was not aware, yeah. but he feels that it was withheld from him, and therefore, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah. These are some difficult, you know, uh, scenarios where uh, so the divorce has happened, and uh, and he's already married and he's living his life. So, well, opinion is that they should actually maybe she can just. You know, if if she's if she wants to, if she gets over her hurt and all that, not immediately rush into a marriage, but over a period of time, you know, she can definitely marry. Right? Pastor's opinion. <laughs> right. Okay. Um yeah, only biblical reasons if um yeah, for the the departing also is a biblical reason. So yes, the the, uh, the marriage can happen, right? Remarriage can happen. Um, I think Shivakumar's question is that, and then also sometimes it's not physical but mental harassment or torture. Can we categorize this as violence? Okay, um, good question, Chaya. We'll come back next class, right? We'll take. Uh, yeah, we'll just think about it. Yes, uh, mental harassment also is damaging, right? Okay, we'll come back next class, right? Thank you. Right.